I have the honor of introducing our next speaker, Mary DeRosa. Uh, Mary is currently a distinguished visitor from practice at the Georgetown University Law Center. She came to Georgetown in 2011 after years of distinguished service in government, including two stints as legal advisor to the National Security Council. She served in this role during the latter part of the Clinton administration and during the first two years of the Obama administration at which time she also served as Deputy White House Counsel, Deputy Assistant to the President. She also served previously as Chief Counsel for National Security for the Senate Judiciary Committee. I had the privilege of working with Mary during the first months of the Obama administration on one of the most difficult issues the new administration was confronting, what to do with the Guantanamo detention facility. In my capacity as ambassador at large for war crimes issues, I had lead responsibility during the last three years of the, of the Bush administration and the early part of the Obama administration for the diplomatic negotiations necessary to transfer prisoners out of Guantanamo. Already during the transition between the administrations, Mary was very engaged on this issue, and my first discussions with her about it took place during that time. Once she became NSC legal advisor, I continued to work closely with her, and I came away very impressed by her commitment to resolving a vexing national security challenge, and in a way that was incredibly thoughtful and ethical, but which was also very pragmatic, showing that the two are not incompatible, a theme that is in keeping with our focus today, the centrality of rule of law in the fight against terrorism. Speaking from that perspective and from her experience at the Center of Policy Formulation and Decision Making, Mary is uniquely positioned to speak to us today on the challenges that lie ahead for the next president. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce Mary DeRosa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clint. Um, and thanks to, uh, to all of our uh, hosts, New America and uh, Arizona State University and um, uh, the McCain Institute for inviting me here. Uh, and uh, I thought uh, while um, you were chewing, uh, uh, I would talk a little about um, focus uh, instead some observations from the sort of being uh, inside and practicing uh, in this area and observing the real challenges for a president uh, who, uh, who wants to uphold the, uh, the rule of law. Um, at some of the, 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 rather than talk about some of the substantive issues I thought I'd um, talk about some of the practical and institutional challenges that uh, uh, any administration faces, but particularly a, uh, a, new, a, new, a new one. So obviously we're in the last weeks of a presidential election, and there are two uh, very different scenarios about how, uh, how that will come out. Uh, I'm gonna only talk about the scenario in which uh, we have a president who actually cares about the rule of law, um, uh, in in part uh, in part because I'm not uh, um, emotionally equipped to engage the other the other scenario, but uh, but but um, also because it's just uh, um, there's a lot less to say uh, 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 if if you have a president uh, that doesn't uh, that doesn't care. Uh, or at least it's a very, very different conversation. But I, I don't think that's what's go going to happen. I think we're going to elect uh, a president who uh, is, is very committed to advancing the rule of law domestically and internationally. And uh, that commitment is, uh, is the first step and the most, in a very important step, but no matter how much she cares uh, and no matter how committed, it's not an easy task uh, and uh, so I'll talk a little bit about what some of the challenges are that a new president will face. Uh, so there's a new president. The president cares about uh, exercising power uh, with regard for legal constraints, following the law, considering ourselves to be bound by the law. Uh, uh, she will believe uh, or s say she believes that we gain more in, uh, in credibility and legitimacy by doing, uh, by doing this, by, by considering ourselves constrained 
uh, then we lose in flexibility. But what does that even mean uh, in following the law? It's not always clear, or it often isn't clear, what the law is and what it requires. What if, uh, as has so often been the case in the past 15 years, uh, new threats from international terrorism, which uh, uh, is the subject of this conference today, and other areas, cyber comes to mind, just don't map all that well onto uh, the existing law? What does this respect for rule of law require under those circumstances? Uh, uh, and in that case, it requires uh, of uh, the, the lawyers and of the administration uh, that they act honestly and in good faith to figure out what, what the law means uh, in this new area. I have two uh, early, excuse me, post 9-11 issues that I'm going to use uh, as, uh, as an examples of, to give a sense of, of what I'm talking about or how, how these issues arise. Uh, we were attacked on 9-11, as, uh, as everyone knows, um, by a non-state actor, Al-Qaeda. The international laws relating to, uh, to force and in in conflict were written uh, with state actors in mind. Uh, so if, uh, if, you, if you look, uh, do a, a literal reading of the UN Charter and, uh, and related law, you could come away, and many uh, many commentators did and have, uh, with the, uh, the view that a non-state actor like Al-Qaeda cannot engage in an armed attack in the legal sense of that term. Uh, uh, the implications of that are, very, are quite significant because if you can't engage, again, in the legal sense of the term, if you can't engage in an armed attack, we, the U.S., cannot respond uh, in self-defense, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, if you accept that view, uh, then uh, the entire legal framework related to self-defense and armed conflict uh, is unavailable, would have been unavailable to the U.S. Uh, in response to al-Qaeda's attacks. The U.S., as we all know, rejected this view. We viewed ourselves and we continue to view ourselves uh, to be within the framework, the armed conflict framework, and subject to international humanitarian law. So was this a cynical uh, manipulation of international law? Uh, did we fail to uphold the law by, by reinterpreting it to uh, achieve the result we wanted? Uh, obviously, I do not believe that we did. Uh, the technical or literal, in that case, interpretation of, of the provisions under the circumstances we faced would have made no sense. Uh, it would lead to a conclusion that is inconsistent uh, with the purposes of those laws. Uh, law should respond to experience, and uh, uh, we took the position, we, the U.S. government, took the position uh, that the, the law could and did respond to this new threat. We were criticized, uh, and uh, some, uh, some continue to criticize that, that position, but that doesn't mean, of course, that we were wrong. Um, but another example from a, the a same period uh, shows uh, what I believe to be the flip side of that analysis, and that was the, the legal conclusion in early 2002 um, about the applicability of Geneva Conventions to our treatment of Al-Qaeda or Taliban detainees. Uh, the lawyers in that case, the, the um, Department of Justice, law Justice lawyers, concluded that, uh, I mean, this is simplifying uh, the, uh, the legal discussion in both of these cases, uh, but to, because the point I'm making is not the legal one, but they concluded that neither the third or fourth um, Geneva Conventions apply to the detainees, and therefore they said uh, that the U.S. Uh, was not bound by those, uh, uh, by the conventions um, uh, at all in its treatment of detainees. It was free, therefore, as a legal matter to ig ignore restrictions and processes in those conventions. Unlike the first example I used, uh, I don't 
believe that that was a fair, uh, uh, credible analysis of the law in applying it to a new threat. Uh, uh, when your legal analysis, very importantly, leads you to a conclusion that no law applies uh, in a situation that's typically highly regulated by law, that should be a very big uh, red flag. And, uh, and uh, I agree with the comments that uh, 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 Hina Shamsi made uh, just a few minutes ago that although you can uh, you can use you know substitute uh, uh, and uh, policy uh, constraints uh, and policy constraints are important but they are not an adequate substitute uh, for law in these areas uh, so there I believe that interpretation was inconsistent with the spirit of the conventions and, uh, and, and, and was, in fact, an attempt to uh, escape, uh, escape restrictions. So I mentioned these examples, again, not to relitigate them. Uh, these issues have uh, been resolved. Uh, and, uh, but there are many issues like that that have come up for the current president and that will come up for the next one in the counterterrorism area and others. And, the, and the, the new administration and the new president and the new lawyers have to be very aware uh, of, of how they're going to think very hard about how do they approach these new and difficult questions when they come up. So I want to raise two uh, specific institutional challenges that make these, uh, this task harder uh, the task that I just described, the task of developing the legal analysis in this area, harder in the national security area than it might otherwise be. Um, first, uh, because of the nature of, of national security decisions, how they're made, the, the sensitivity of those decisions, um, uh, uh, and the, there are, as a practical matter, considerably fewer formal and informal external checks on, uh, uh, on the lawyers who practice in this area, the lawyers in the government who practice in this area. Um, uh, the, uh, there are four, there are uh, the, um, oh, I'm sorry. So that's the first issue that I'm gonna address is how you, the quality control, how do you, uh, how do you, uh, maintain quality control in this very important legal area uh, when, uh, when you have uh, relatively fewer, uh, uh, less guidance and fewer external uh, checks on, on the lawyers. Second, I want to talk about the failure of Congress or, uh, to engage in the past several years uh, on, uh, on war powers issues and use of force issues and uh, the strains that that places on um, uh, separation of, uh, of powers and, uh, and related um, rule of law uh, and the rule of law challenges that, that it raises. So the first topic, uh, good uh, quality legal advice uh, is uh, essential obviously to protecting the rule of law that requires good lawyers, and we have uh, very, very good uh, lawyers in this field. Uh, but, but, but good lawyers uh, uh, are, you know, critical but not enough. Uh, and many of the things that provide that control provide a sort of quality control, informal and formal quality control mechanisms in other le le uh, legal fields don't operate the same way for lawyers uh, in the national security world. U.S. courts are uh, reluctant to become involved in national security legal matters, uh, relying on a number of threshold doctrines, political question doctrines, standing, et cetera, um, uh, to, uh, to uh, avoid uh, for, for, you know, and these, the doctrines, I'm not saying that this is, that they are incorrect to do this, but uh, the result is that, uh, that they avoid review in many, many sensitive national security matters. Legal analysis less, is less available to the public uh, for comment and criticism. 
Uh, so that informal check that most lawyers have in most areas of law is less available. Members of Congress have less insight, generally speaking, into the legal advice in this area. And, uh, and when they do, uh, they are often constrained in, uh, about, in what they can say about it um, uh, publicly. And, uh, and, and, and beyond that, the sensitivity of national security decisions risks, even internally, limiting the number of people who can, who can or do uh, uh, deliberate on these issues. Uh, and uh, uh, so all of that, uh, inevitably, uh, just as a matter of human nature, there's nothing that inspires you or focuses you like knowing somebody's going to be looking over your shoulder and judging what you're doing. Uh, and there simply is less of that uh, in the national security area. And, and that is on top of the fact that these are some of the, these are issues that relate to uh, 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 decisions, po uh, policy operational decisions with the highest of stakes often. And so the pressures are tremendous. So what does uh, a new administration do uh, to, to address this uh, uh, not very concrete, but very real uh, issue uh, with, uh, with national security legal decision making. Uh, I uh, would suggest that there are some processes uh, and um, uh, trends in the current administration uh, that the next administration uh, would uh, do very well to continue. Um, first, and this is uh, this is a little in the weeds, I recognize, but it's a pet issue of mine. And I actually, I, can, I think it's very important. Um, and that is the lawyers group. So what is the lawyers group? It's a group of lawyers, cleverly. Um, uh, and it is a, a group uh, within the, the, in, uh, the uh, national security uh, executive branch legal decision making. It's the, uh, the senior lawyers from the State Department, the uh, uh, Department of Justice, Office of Legal Counsel, uh, the, de the uh, Defense Department, both uh, the General Counsel and the Counsel to the, uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, the Counsel to the uh, Director of National Intelligence, the CIA General Counsel, and, uh, and the NSC Legal Advisor, which is the role I played, who coordinates this group. Uh, they, meet, they meet regularly more than weekly, in person or, or by, uh, uh, by Stivitz video uh, conference. Uh, and, and they, so this is the group that uh, um, uh, deliberates on and develops uh, in the current administration, uh, the legal advice for the president on most of the, scene, uh, the serious uh, uh, high level uh, uh, issues, legal issues uh, that, uh, um, that the president and his senior advisors are considering. Uh, so this, this group, uh, this entity uh, existed before, um, but it has been in, in this administration, so for almost, uh, almost eight years now, uh, the key forum for deliver deliberation. Um, and the lawyers uh, work together, the, the, the dynamics of the group the lawyers work together they, uh, to reach the right answers. It promotes, um, uh, 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 it promotes quality both because it ensures that a diversity of opinion uh, is represented in the legal decisions and also uh, for a lot, of, uh, a lot of just human reasons uh, that people, uh, you know, that it, it, uh, <coughs> it um, the dynamics and the, uh, you know, you come in, you, uh, it, it improves the quality of the discussion because they, everybody wants to make sure that they are, their peers are, uh, um, uh, you know, that, that they are uh, impressing their peers. I mean, that's a simplistic way of putting it. But in any event, um, it, and it also provides, importantly, a buffer, uh, the group operates to provide a buffer of sorts to increase independence of legal decision making. So um, not that it's not very uh, well known and uh, it is the kind of 
the kind of process that I think uh, it could go away uh, tomorrow uh, if, uh, if, the, um, if the new lawyers and new administration uh, uh, don't commit to it, but I, uh, but I hope they will. So that's my little pet uh, issue, um, uh, although I do, <laughs> do think an important one. Another important step, and we've, uh, we've heard uh, very important for a number of reasons, but specifically on this legal issue, is uh, the push for transparency in particular about legal analysis. Uh, so one way to ensure that more people are, as I said, you know, the, the informal check of uh, public uh, comment and criticism about legal advice, uh, one way to ensure that is to make sure more legal advice is public, even in this area where every instinct is uh, not to make things public. Uh, for, for not, you know, not for self-protective reasons, for, for valid uh, uh, national security reasons, uh, but uh, it is, it is uh, the, the more that can, that can be uh, out in the public, the healthier it is. So the Obama administration has done this in a number of ways, uh, in particular about legal advice. Uh, uh, it's declassified some legal opinions. It has, uh, uh, there have been a series of senior officials and lawyers who've given speeches on uh, legal, legal positions, particularly use of, use of force uh, positions and uh, uh, international uh, different surveillance law, different international law issues, uh, cyber issues. And I, I cannot emphasize enough what a pain it is to, uh, to work through and, and develop uh, uh, these speeches. And everybody is inc incredibly busy. And, so, and, uh, and there appear sometimes when you're trying to persuade people that a speech needs to happen, it's very, very easy to see uh, the downsides uh, uh, in the immediate uh, sense and, and very hard to see the upsides. Often uh, when you're, where you're developing legal advice on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, you're answering the questions that are before you, but if, you're gonna, if somebody's gonna give a speech, you have to think about the questions you haven't dealt with and think about, and think about how they fit in and think about how, what the, the, uh, the impact of, um, uh, of uh, developing uh, the, the sort of broader legal structure uh, is gonna be. Um, and that is hard, and that is irritating, but it is incredibly healthy. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, administration has done, uh, I think, and uh, you know, obviously I'm not its harshest critic, but um, I think it's done a, a terrific job at pushing on those things. Uh, and because it is so difficult, uh, um, I think that is, uh, you know, that is, uh, again, uh, uh, you know, that it, it is a lesson, I believe, that this administration has learned over the course of the seven years that I would hope would be that the new administration would, would pick up on. Uh, I'll mention also the, um, uh, the, the PPG and the, you know, the, the transparency on uh, targeting policy and other kind of policy, uh, um, uh, transparency, 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 transparency initiatives, um, a real push by the intelligence uh, community or by the DNI in, uh, in the intelligence community post Snowden. These are all very healthy uh, and very healthy in particular uh, um, for the lawyers uh, who are developing legal advice in this area. Uh, as I said, it's not easy. It's a classic example of something that has uh, indirect long-term benefits uh, and very direct uh, short-term downsides. Uh, you almost never, uh, you know, come out with a, um, you know, a speech or a legal position on something and hear, thank you, that's great, you know, now I get it. Um, uh, and uh, uh, instead, uh, you, you hear, well, what about this, and what about this, and what about this, and you didn't answer this, and I don't agree with this. I mean, you know, if you're out there with your legal views, you're going to get uh, substantive criticisms, uh, and uh, and that's uh, uh, super irritating, um, but <laughs> but it's really important, um, and uh, and it is uh, it is it is very important medicine 
uh, for the lawyers in this area. And, uh, and it is because it's hard and because it is uh, against the natural instinct, instinct of most national security policymakers and personnel, uh, it's, there's going to have to be a real decision and an effort to push, to push in the new administration uh, to continue that. So one, uh, I don't know how I'm doing on time, one uh, final challenge that I wanted to, uh, to mention and, uh, for, for the new president uh, it's an obvious challenge, not not uh, not something that uh, you know that only I have noticed, uh, and its uh, solution is uh, extremely uh, intractable. Um, but that is the the disinterest uh, in uh, the United States uh, Congress currently, in, or in in recent years, uh, to play its constitutional role on, uh, on war powers and use of force issues. Use of force overseas um, is uh, the decision to use force overseas uh, is, uh, has significant consequences. Obviously, it's one of the most momentous, one of the most important uh, decisions that, uh, that a president and a government can make for, uh, for the nation, for its citizens. Uh, and uh, it is an area uh, where participation of both of the political branches is most needed. Um, but what we have seen in the past several years as the threats the th uh, threats have grown more complicated, more, uh, the so solutions have become less clear, uh, appro uh, the, uh, the approaches are more fraught. Um, there is, uh, for a variety of reasons, the, the, the United States Congress is becoming less and less uh, likely to become involved, uh, particularly in uh, authorizing, uh, uh, authorizing uh, use of force. And that's not to say Congress isn't interested in these issues or that it ignores these issues. They certainly, these issues, they certainly pay attention. But what they've been uh, reluctant to do um, uh, over really the course of this administration is to act uh, as, uh, as a body to, uh, to, uh, to authorize or to refuse to authorize, uh, decline to authorize uh, a president's decisions. So generally, of course, uh, it is the president who takes the heat for this and uh, uh, for acting uh, without congressional authorization or uh, uh, in some way, uh, you know, inconsistently in the view of uh, um, uh, many, some people with congressional authorization uh, uh, and, uh, and the criticism goes that either uh, the president hasn't sought uh, authorization or the president hasn't sought authorization uh, correctly uh, or convincingly, has not exercised sufficient leadership to, uh, to uh, uh, get Congress to act on these issues. And, and I'm not saying that, there's, that, 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 that those are unfair criticisms. I think that uh, there is, uh, there is uh, you know, probably uh, blame on both sides and, uh, and lessons uh, to learn from, uh, from both sides. But the other side of it that doesn't, I think, get talked about as much is, uh, is the president can't duck. The president can't. The president has to make policy decisions and, uh, and operational decisions. And, uh, and the, if you're in a situation which uh, has, has come up on, on several occasions in this administration where everybody is on the, in Congress, generally everybody's in the same place about uh, a particular use of force or that you're a acting in a certain way overseas, um, but Congress uh, doesn't want to be asked to authorize uh, or doesn't uh, uh, doesn't act to uh, to you know uh, determine whether it will authorize. You have um, uh, you know the, the, there's a certain game of chicken on the part of the president who's you e you either have to go and you say you have to authorize this for me or I can't do it, uh, and then 
if they don't authorize it and everybody still, you know, if they don't act, you know, that is a, that is a, um, and, and maybe it's the appropriate, uh, maybe it's the appropriate decision, but it is not without some significant consequences if you have a policy where it's not like they're saying, no, we don't think you should do this, they're saying, uh, we just don't, you know, just don't ask. Um, uh, or you say, well, I would really like you to authorize this, um, uh, you, the president, uh, but uh, I, don't th I don't think you need to, I don't think I legally need your authorization, and then, co then Congress says, well, then why would I do it if you don't need it, you know? So it is, I mean, and I don't mean to suggest by a long shot uh, that everything uh, it has, you know, that, 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 uh, that this administration, I don't think this administration would suggest that everything they have done is, uh, is exactly right, but uh, it is a, a problem at least as much of, uh, of the Congress's making. Uh, and so, and this is an area, I mean, if you talk about the current president, uh, where really some of the, the some of the um, most significant uh, criticisms of legal positions that this administration has taken have been in this area. Uh, it has been about interpretation of uh, the War Powers Resolution or interpretation of the 2001 AUMF. Uh, uh, interpretations that, uh, that uh, uh, many believe are strained, uh, some believe are not available, not credible. credible. And so putting aside uh, whether those criticisms uh, are valid, uh, I think it's significant that what the president has done is significant, not again in a sort of defense of the president, but in a, in a how you deal with these, as significant as a sort of sign of how uh, you can in difficult situations deal with these situations is uh, in the end on, on those issues the, uh, the president has said, uh, I'm, has interpreted a statute, has said, found the authority by interpreting a statute rather than by saying um, I have the power under the Constitution to take this action on my own. So, uh, so even, so he's preserved in that a role for Congress uh, um, and has recognized the authority because if you're interpreting a statute, you're saying, Congress, you could change this. You don't agree with me, you could change this. So, um, uh, 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 so that is, you know, but that's the situation we're in. That's the kind of issues it raises. What does the new president do about this? I have absolutely no idea. Um, <laughs> uh, it is, I mean, uh, it's, it, it is important, I think, to recognize the problem and try early in a new administration, maybe a fresh start, maybe a new set of, um, uh, of uh, per people involved uh, uh, can be used to change the dynamics. Um, I, I, I wish that I were, were more optimistic about that. Um, but the other thing I would say is dealing with this requires people in the executive branch to some, sometimes to in a way act against your own sort of personal institutional instincts. I know and I, I mean I admit that when I was first um, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the Obama administration uh, and a lawyer and sometimes issues would come up or shoot, is there a question here, should we try to get Congress to uh, raise, uh, you know, uh, uh, revisit the 2001 AUMF, my instinct was like, oh, no, why do we want to get them in our business? That's just going to make things uh, more difficult um, uh, and uh, more difficult, you know, and, and it, you know, it's out there it's harder to control. Uh, and normally, in a world in which Congress is, is you know, uh, uh, engaging and uh, defending its own constitutional territory, that's an okay, that's a perfectly okay uh, instinct on the part of the executive branch because Congress is gonna push back and it's, gonna, it's going to work itself out, um, but that is not an okay uh, instinct in the executive branch in the current climate. And, uh, and what uh, I think people need to recognize at the beginning of new administration is you can't, act on those natural instincts and you have to in fact uh, push from the beginning to get Congress to engage on these issues because it's only going to hurt 
Uh, you, it's only going to hurt the administration, and it's only going to hurt the country, and it's only going to hurt the rule of law if you have a situation where, uh, where the president is, um, is acting uh, without, uh, without uh, the Congress being involved in some of the most difficult issues. Uh, so I think I will, uh, uh, I will stop there. Um, I, I mean, uh, other than to say uh, new, new president, new administration uh, uh, needs to focus, I hope will focus very early uh, and thoughtfully on these issues and recognize that just, just wanting, deeply caring about uh, about uh, respecting the rule of law is uh, is really not enough, and you have to and you have to um, deal with some of these institutional uh, challenges. Uh, so I will stop there and take questions if anybody has them. Okay, uh, here. Hi, I'm uh, Larry Weiner, ASU College of Law. I'd like to ask you uh, about what you describe as your uh, pet interest, this <laughs> legal group, which I find very intriguing, particularly because of the obvious parallels to private practice, how a private law firm or a private corporation legal department might operate. So within this group, for example, um, how do you determine who the client is? A particular individual, a governmental department? What about confidentiality? I mean, how? How uh, freely can you even talk amongst yourselves about some of the issues? Um, the public interest, is the public interest, however it might be defined or determined, does that go into your deliberations in giving legal advice? I don't know how much you can say about how this group operates, but it's, it's yeah, really quite well, interesting to no, me. No, I think it's a great question. And um, the issue of who is the client for government lawyers in this area and in other areas is always a, it's an interesting um, uh, and uh, uh, you know philosophical to some degree you know but uh, but it can have I mean it can make a difference and I would say in this group uh, the client is the uh, at least the 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 president or the you know the the policy of uh, that the the the, uh, the president and the senior uh, the National Security Council is pursuing. Not to say uh, that uh, if it's an elite, you know that you're uh, that you. Um, uh, I guess the presidency um, and the National Security Council as an institution is the client, not the individual uh, agencies. Uh, and that is one of the benefits. I mean, certainly people come into this lawyers group and they represent, they are, you know, they are part of a, an administration, I mean, I'm sorry, a, an agency or a department, uh, and they are, uh, they are representing the views uh, and the interests of that department. But I think one of the positive things about, um, uh, the, about the lawyers group is that that is, you know, heard and understood, but there is, uh, then because of the nature of, of the work that they have to do tends to uh, fall away and the, what, what really drives, and I, it sounds um, uh, maybe uh, uh, like I'm being, having a sort of too rosy a view of this, but I really do, uh, I have seen this and I, and I do believe it, that, uh, that the, the best legal argument and the legal arguments do, uh, tempered by reality, I mean these are Practical people in practical jobs, but uh, but the law uh, does uh, um, does prevail in the discussions, and not the um, the institutional interests of the particular departments. It's one of the things that is uh, uh, it is very important that those interests are in there, but not uh, everybody isn't just sort of in their own corner. Um, Public interest, absolutely, I would say, is part of the calculus in in all in all of those discussions. Uh, so, yes. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Kambi, but I'm with the Pakistani Spectator, and you said that politician, uh, you use word congressman, they are constrained uh, by saying something or saying not not saying certain thing, yeah. and my question is. Are they constrained by some legal or moral obligation? Are they are constrained by a political calculation? Right. Uh, for example, I mean, this is a very debatable because of this uh, election season. Uh, most Republicans believe that Obama doesn't want to use word um, uh, 
uh, Islamic terrorism because he doesn't want to irritate his Muslim vote, who majority, as you know, go to Democrat Party, especially nowadays, because other guy is very loose cannon and he is saying every kind of thing what he could say. So, so, so because of this Obama's calculation, not even using something that is very factual, given that most of the terrorists that uh, event are attacked, I'm a Muslim, so I'm being very careful not to call myself terrorist, but most of the uh, terrorism act was committed by Muslims, so there is nothing wrong to say Islamic terrorism or Muslim extremism. Mm -hmm. So Obama's very, very, uh, it's, it's that, it's, I mean, it's, he come across as a kind of coward with the Republican standard that he doesn't want to use this word. So are they constrained by some legal or moral obligation or they are constrained because they don't want to lose their vote bank? Thanks. So uh, I mean, what I was talking about was, uh, was a, a much more mundane, uh, and that is the, um, that th this is, the information is classified. Uh, 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 very often, information uh, that is shared uh, with the Hill is, uh, um, is, is classified, and unless declassified by the executive branch, uh, it is, they are uh, constrained in speaking about it publicly. Um, they can press it, it um, but that, that is, uh, they are constrained. So that, that is the, the point I was making there. Uh, obviously there are any number of uh, uh, political, uh, you know, uh, constraints uh, and uh, uh, um, incentives uh, for members of Congress and others to, you know, to, when they are speaking, but that was uh, particularly in this area, I was really just talking about the classification issue. Yes. Uh, yeah, just uh, with regard to your last comment about the Hill being constrained uh, to not make public to their constituents anything that the administration says is classified, I wonder if you'd comment on my understanding, which is that that's not really true because when we set up the intelligence committees, we put a provision in the resolution creating them that says if a majority of the committee disagrees with the administration, based on what we did with the church committee, uh, as a co-equal branch, they can, if it goes to the full House or Senate and there's a majority vote in a closed session, make it public. Uh, and in fact, this has been done at least once with regard to the Panama Canal negotiations where they made public things that the administration under President Carter said could not be made public because they were too classified. So my question is one, is that your understanding? And two, uh, is that the position of the executive branch now or do they still maintain, for example, with regard to the torture report that Congress could not have made the entire report public as opposed to just the introduction. Yes, um, so uh, yeah, I am aware of that process and this is one of many areas where you have differences of legal opinion between executive branch uh, and uh, um, the legislative branch about, about uh, authorities. Uh, my, uh, you know, I've worked on the Hill but I'm a creature really of the executive branch. My view is it is, and I, and I you know, the, uh, I think the cases uh, support this, that that, that, that is um, the decision uh, to classify is a decision uh, that is a power of, of the president. But uh, certainly under those, under the um, congressional uh, process that you talk about, they can, they, they can in, 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 in very little uh, limited circumstances have uh, taken, uh, taken that action. You see it very, very, very seldom. And I think in part that is not because there's a con concession about uh, the, the legal, uh, the legal uh, or the authority issues and it's more because uh, as a practical reality the, the executive branch controls the information and can decide with whom it will share that information, and uh, and so there's a concern, you know, that there and and members of Congress are responsible people. They don't want to uh, be in a situation where they're uh, where they're releasing information that uh, that could be uh, harmful. So I think it, as a practical matter, that comes up very seldom. Uh, uh, more often, what you see is if a member of Congress thinks they know something that should be declassified, they press the. 
uh, they press the government to declassify. And they might even say publicly, there's something I know that I think needs to be de declassified. So, you know, go tell them to declassify. You know, so it's more that kind of process than the one that you described. Hi, I'm Leanne Howard, and I am with the Def Defense Department, but I am not a lawyer. Okay. So my question is more on your experience, and if and how you look at opportunity costs and risk in some of the counterterrorism decisions that have passed by you, and specifically in terms of fleeting opportunities over time that change, or the impact of making a decision or not making a decision at a specific point in time. Does that make sense? Uh, could you could you elaborate on that a little? I'm t uh, sure. So, uh, anecdotally, I if we have a policy that allows us to do something in a certain part of the world, but not another part of the world, but then the opportunity presents itself in another part of the world, and it's a fleeting opportunity critical to national security, but the strict <laughs> interpretation uh, needs to be reviewed as to if, how, and when we could do something. I'm just curious from the legal standpoint, from the NSC standpoint, what is the, the discussion that takes place with the policymakers in that, uh, or even with whom to partner or when to accept or reject a partnership uh, offer? How does the legal office get involved in, in reviewing those types of gray areas? Yeah. Thank you. Well, so if the constraints that you're talking about are the, uh, is, is a legal one, is a, a legal, the uh, legal analysis is we can do it here and we can't do it there. Um, uh, then the lawyers would, uh, you know, the, the, the lawyers in this area work very fast often. I mean, the, the issues come at you very quickly. Uh, you try always to, to get ahead and think of things that might come up and, and often that does happen. But uh, um, so uh, the lawyers would, would uh, Tell the policymakers there is, you know, you know what what are the legal, you know, the, the legal reason for this. But we will look and 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 look and try to see if there's a way to do what the the um, operators or policymakers want to do uh, in a way that does not uh, uh, that ha that doesn't um, have the same uh, legal issues. If it's not a legal issue, if it's a policy uh, guidance. Um, and uh, then the, the, the lawyers still often are at least in their, uh, in their roles, in their departments. I know in my uh, role as the NSC legal advisor, I would be in that meeting. Uh, and uh, so part of my job was not just, yes, it's legal, no, it's not legal, you know, sit back. It, it was thinking about how, uh, you know, how you need to, uh, make the decision in a way that is going to be uh, uh, a sort of judgment and uh, process and how do you make the decision in a way that is, uh, that is uh, going to be most um, uh, sustainable or, uh, and, and so I'm, you, know, you might even give advice, not yes you should do that or no you should not do that if it's a policy matter. Uh, if, if, you, if it, you know, not that lawyers never speak on policy but you know, that's not your central function, but uh, a central function is also, um, uh, you know, in, I don't know exactly the situation, but I can imagine a lawyer saying, look, you know, you have a policy out there that says you can't do that. You need to have, if you're going to change that policy on the fly, you need to explain why you're doing it and go through a process to understand it. And that, I think, is also a, a role of the lawyers in this area. Not so much the lawyers group that I talked about, but in their, in their counseling and, and advising positions. When, when, uh, Maybe one more question. Okay, one more. We're here. Sorry, I, I hope I'm, <laughs> okay. Thank you. It's very interesting, actually. Two weeks ago, uh, the Congress passed a very interesting law, JASTA, Justice Against Sponsors of Tourism, despite the veto by Obama administration. Do you think this, this, this law, this, this bill, by the way, created a wave like tsunami across the world, you know, with you know, criticisms worldwide. Um, do you think this law would help the next president uh, uh, fight uh, against uh, terror? Another law right now in the Congress uh, is about to designate Muslim Brotherhood as terrorist organization. 
would this law as well help the next president in his fight or her fight against terror? That's, that's something we need to know. Um, so, I mean, both of these, you know, I, I, uh, Jess, I know, is an example of this, a, 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 a not uncommon uh, 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 conflict between um, a president or the executive branch is thinking about how, you know, sovereign immunity and how if we, if, they can sue, if we can sue them, they can sue us, and the larger uh, impact um, of, uh, of some of these issues. Not that, not that uh, uh, the presidents, presidents or executive branches are, don't care about the personal consequences to, uh, to in that case, uh, um, uh, the 9-11 uh, the victims and the, and the litigants. Uh, but uh, but tend to, uh, particularly in second terms, <laughs> things see, see things in a, uh, a kind of a broader, uh, uh, the broader, more strate strategic uh, issues. Uh, and sometimes that is not, um, uh, that, that, that the, the more immediate um, uh, 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 appeal of, uh, of people like the 9-11 uh, victims, uh, is you know has a little more resonance uh, on, on the hill. So you have um, you have situations where uh, you know in this one where the president vetoed. I think it's his only veto, uh, maybe, uh, and uh, and the veto was overridden. Um, uh, you know, and uh, and so I think it's a similar dynamic probably with the other. I don't know uh, about the other bill that you mentioned, but. Um, no, I don't think that it will help the next president. Uh, I think uh, that, that, uh, that JASTA being out there will help the pre next president. I don't think it will. I think it raises uh, the institutional concerns that the president, that caused the, this president to, uh, um, to, um, uh, to veto it. So overall, I would say not likely to be a positive for the next president. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. <laughs>